following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Israel enters into Nukva, the Promised Land, Part 2. Following the sequence of the Part 1, <coughs> we are going to synthesize what we already said in order to comprehend the mystery of Israel and all of its uh, components or archetypes which are written in the different stories or myths of the Hebrew Bible. Remember that we Gnostics know and understand that all the sacred books have a myth, are myths. Mythology is indeed a science related with the consciousness. We not only study Hebrew mythology, but all types of religious mythology. And in this uh, case, the Hebrew mythology <coughs> is directly related with the science of Kabbalah. The book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, and all the books written by Moses are uh, symbolic. It is absurd to read them literally and to try to interpret or to explain them literally. And uh, as you know, the whole uh, Hebrew Bible is written with Hebrew characters <laughs> where, with 22 letters. And uh, each letter uh, is a symbol of an archetype related with a sacred language. That's why the Bible is called the Word of God. But this Word of God is not English, is not Spanish, is not Italian, is Hebrew, which is a language uh, derived from the sacred languages. And uh, so each uh, Hebrew letter has a meaning that uh, we already explained in the 22 Arcana in the lectures already given and transcribed in the, our website. So, as we explained in the previous lecture, Israel, the name itself, is a archetype, a symbol, <coughs> which encloses a lot, something that we have to 
discover in each one of us. Uh, for the explanation of all the mysteries of the name Israel and all its components, we always refer to the tree of life. Remember that the tree of life is made by ten sephiroth that uh, are the symbol or the synthesis, we will say, of the archetypes that we had to develop because they are many. But we cannot give the description of all of the archetypes because it will be impossible. So these they are related also with the superior dimensions. And they are, of course, uh, uh, spiritual forces, as well as psychic. As you know, the tree of life is made by ten sephiroth, which you always name from the top to the bottom, Keter, Chochma, Bina, Chesed, Gebura, Tifereth, Netza, Hod, Yesod, and Malkut. When we study the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, we then find that the first triangle, Keter, Chochma, Bina, which we call the three primary forces, and that in Christianity is called the Holy Trinity of three unity, three forces in one, in the Hebrew alphabet, they are represented by the three mother letters, Aleph, Shin, and Mem. <coughs> Aleph symbolizes air and is represented in Keter. Shin, which is fire, is represented in Chokhmah. Mem, which is the letter that uh, symbolizes water, represents Bina. So there you have that below this first triangle, you find seven Sephiroth, which in Kabbalah we call it the Ser Ampin. Is a word which means lesser countenance, small face. is my is made by the sephirah below, the mysterious sephirah dat, which means knowledge. And these seven sephirah below the first triangle are represented by seven letters of the Hebrew alphabet, <coughs> which are Resh, Pe, Tav, Kap, Gimel, Valet, and Bet. These seven letters represent, as I said, from Hesed to Malkut down, the seven sephiroth. Then the, the rest, which are twelve letters, because uh, seven plus three are ten, plus twelve made twenty-two. The twelve restant uh, letters of the Hebrew alphabet are related with what we were explaining the 12 tribes of Israel, or 12 uh, forces that descend from the world of Atziluth down into the matter, into the physical body. We have to develop the 22 letters within. Moses gave 10 commandments. 
but indeed uh, there are 22 because each commandment is related to the 22 letters of the sacred alphabet Kabbalistic alphabet so the 12 uh, uh, rest of the letters are always related with Shin with Chokhmah as you remember we said that the Sephira Chokhmah is related with the letter Shin fire and uh, if you visualize the human body and the ten sephirahs, then you see that the first triangle relates to the head and is uh, commanded, controlled by the letter Aleph. The second triangle is related to the chest <coughs> and is controlled by the letter Shin, fire. Then the, the third, <coughs> the third triangle, related with the hips and sexual organ, is related with the letter Mem. So that's why when we talk about the rest of the 12 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, which are related with the 12 tribes of Israel, we said it is related with the letter Shin with Chokhmah, which relates to the heart. In order to understand how the, these archetypes <coughs> descend into the physical body, then we have to visualize the physical body. Because the physical body, of course, crystallizes all of those forces through the blood. Remember that it is stated that the blood is a vehicle of the spirit. Indeed, when we breathe, when we inhale the air, we inhale Aleph. That Aleph <coughs> enters the lungs and purifies the blood, which is the letter Shin. That's why the Father and the Son are united in the heart, the purified soul is Aleph and Shin together in our human organism. So if the letter Shin relates to the 12 tribes, to Chokhmah, which means wisdom, it is easy to understand that through the blood is how those archetypes enter into the body in a in potentiality. Our duty is to develop that. <coughs> Israel, or the development of Israel, represents the human me being made into the image of God. Now, as you remember, Israel is written with Yod and Shin, which makes, makes the word sh Ish which means fire. This also means man, male. Isha means woman. So when you said Ish, Ra, which is a solar light, as we explain, Ra in Egypt is a solar light, just letter Resh. Because if you add the letter Ajin to the letter Resh, and then it's evil in Hebrew. There's a difference. But this Israel, the letter Resh by itself, is the solar light. So when you said Ish Ra, you mean the solar man. The solar man man into the image of God, because this Ish Ra El. This El, of course, is masculine. Implies all the attributes of God in one body. So, as uh, we explained in the previous lecture, Israel is made by the letter Shin, I mean Yod, Shin, Resh, 
I don't know you can do it uh, even doing backwards. Israel. And uh, if you remember, we explained that this Israel that represents the 12 archetypes within which or with, with are connected to the archetypes in the world of Atsiluth. The world of Atsiluth is a world of divine emanations, the world of the Logos. The world of God. And there is where we find the archetypes that need to descend into the matter in order to fulfill their duty, which is to make an image, a creature, which is the image of God. Without those archetypes, the man into the image of God, Ish, Ra, El, cannot exist. Remember, we are not talking here about the race of Israel that lives in the Middle East. We're talking about the meaning, Kabbalistically, of this symbol. Because as well, uh, you find, for instance, the Brahmans, Brahma, which is the father in Sanskrit. In India, there is a, a sect which is called the Brahmans. In order to be a Brahman, is like to be an Israelite. Kabbalistically speaking. But you find in India, of course, a lot of Brahmins that literally think that they are the selected race. As in Israel, they, they think that they are the, the chosen ones as well because they read literally. So, in the world of Atziluth, you find ten names of God that synthesize these archetypes, divine archetypes. <coughs> the first name is Eheie, which means I am. It's in Keter. The second name in Chokhma <coughs> is Yodhe Babhe, which is translated as Yahava or Yahova. The third archetype is Yahava Elohim. Bina. Then the fourth is El, which is Hesed. <coughs> El by itself means God, Mel. Then the, in Gebura, we find the archetype Elohim Gibor. Elohim Gibor, which means the strength of God. Or the justice of God. Gibor, Gebura. Okay. Then in Tifereth, we find the other archetype which is called Eloah, Va, Vaat, Yod, He, Bav, He. This is the longest of all of them. All of these are mantras, Hebrew mantras, Kabbalistic mantras. In Etzah, we find the other archetype. Which is called uh, Jahaba Sabaot. <coughs> this uh, Sabaot means army or, or hosts. The hosts of Jehovah's, we will say it would mean. And then in Hall we find Elohim Sabaot, the hosts of gods and goddesses. Then in Yesod we find El Shaddai, or Shaddai el Hai, which is a sexual power. And in Malkut, Adonai, <coughs> which means the Lord. Those are the ten names of the archetypes in Atziluth, which uh, together with the twelve tribes of Israel make twenty-two, as you see. So those are, in synthesis, the archetypes that descend through Chokhmah in the world of Da'at. 
The sefirah da'at that we always explain is a Hebrew word for gnosis, knowledge. And in the book of Genesis, it refers to the tree of good and evil. So we will say that in the world of Atziluth, there is not that word that we call evil. Or clip or clipoth. There's no clipoth there. But here below in that, it is obvious that we find because that it refers as the tree of good and evil. So that force could become evil or good according to the activity of those forces. And we explained that it is in that where the first duality of that trinity appears in order to create. Because the three primary forces, Keter, Chochma, Bina, which represent the world of Asilut, the world of archetypes that have the power to create, need to reunite in a given point in order to do it. That given point is that, the tree of good and evil. Knowledge. And of course, in that mysterious sephira, which is below the first triangle, exactly in the throat of the imaginary man, if you see the human being, is in the throat, is where God creates that there's a given point. Because the Trinity divides in two. That we call Abba and Aima. Or Ima. Abba and Ima. Father and Mother. And it's here in the throat. Where occurs that which is written in the book of John. In the beginning was the word... The word was with God, and the word was God. That word <coughs> is Shin, fire. That represents the three primary forces. But as you see, the feminine aspect has to appear. And that's what we call the Nugva, which refers to many levels. But we said it is the promised land because land, earth, matter, mother is a nugva in different levels in, in Kabbalah. Represented, of course, in the book of Genesis with the four rivers that came from one river that was watering the Garden of Eden. This Garden of Eden is of course that. <coughs> and I told you that the first emanation or feminine aspect of that Israel or archetypes that come from Chokmah is called Sarai. And if you observe the letters, how you write Sarai in Hebrew, the first letter of Sarai is Shin. The second is Resh, and the third is Yod. Sharai is how you write it. In other words, if you take the word El, which means God, out of Israel, and then you form the word Sharai, or Sarai, which means princess. It refers to the feminine aspect of Israel in the highest level. The had to descend. And that's why this word Sharai, as you see, always hides the letter Yod and the letter Resh. And I told you in previous lectures that the letter Resh relates to the head. And of course, Shin, the fire of Chokhmah, which is the second aspect that we call it the sun in Christianity, or Vishnu, the creator. But that fire, that creative fire of Chokhmah, which means 
I will be. <coughs> the one that will be, because Keter is in a state of abstract essence. Like Chokma is the one that descends and creates the universe. That's why it is said that Christ, Chokma, is the one that sustains the universe. Any universe, any cosmos. Because descends according to the tree of life in that. There in that, you find the potence, the creative potence of God, which Christianity called Lucifer. This is a Latin word. Luz, luz, lux, luci, luci, light and fair, carrier of light. Sometimes it's fair, fire, or sometimes strength or force. But Lucifer means carrier of light, which is the fire. That sheen is Lucifer. But one thing is Lucifer carrying the light in heaven, and another thing is the fallen Lucifer. When that light falls, it transforms itself into Shatan. You see the word Shatan, also written with Shin. So in the Hebrew letters, in the Hebrew language, hides all the mysteries. This Shatan, this Lucifer, is individual in each one of us. Gnostically speaking, let us understand that Lucifer is not somebody outside of us. It's inside. Christ is inside of us. Every, all those archetypes are inside. And they exist because through them we create... <coughs> The man into the image of God. So in that is how uh, we find the mystery of creation, the word, the logos, <coughs> that uh, in the book of John relates, talks about. So the first archetype that descend into Mizraim. Or Matsarim, as we say somebody, is Mizraim. This word Mizraim means Egypt. But it is not the country Egypt in the Middle, Middle East or in Africa. No. It refers to the Sephira Malkut, the very bottom of the tree of life. And that refers to our physical body. That is Egypt. Better said, Misraim. Misraim. Um, this word Misraim is written with two mems, two waters. And in the book of Genesis, it is stated that uh, Abraham descended to the Garden of Eden or to Misraim, Egypt. But we told you, we explained that this. Abraham is the Sephira Hesed. Abraham means exalted father. It refers to the first division in that that Abraham, exalted father, is an emanation of uh, Bina. <coughs> the Holy Spirit. And he marries Sarai, which is his half-sister. Because Sarai is also an emanation of the three primary forces. Here in that, we find Sarai and Abraham. Abraham, in the height, exalted father. Through them, descend. They had to descend. There is another... Abraham, our exalted father, which is El, Hesed, that each one of us has within. So inside of our psyche, in the very depth of our psyche, we have our own particular individual spirit, Hesed, which means mercy, charity. This Hesed is Abraham the exalted individual father in each one of us. 
So Abraham represents Hesed and is also represented in Da'at. Is this archetype. This Abraham is what the Bible says, the Ruach Elohim. Ruach means spirit. The spirit of the Elohim. Which Elohim are we talking here, of course? The creative forces of the world of Atzilut. That Ruach Elohim is inside of us. It's our own spirit. That Ruach Elohim, Abraham, is the one that has to create the man into the image of God. Or give the first step. As we explained in the previous lecture. So then we have to perform that work because it's written that in the beginning the Spirit of God was hovering upon the face of the waters. So that uh, Spirit of God has the image, the archetypes, in order to create that man inside of us. And we explained that in order to create that human being inside of us, he needs a womb. That womb is the spinal medulla. That is spiritual womb. If you see how the spinal medulla and the brain are connected to all the nervous systems, to all the organs, to all those inner organs that we have in the physical body. So we will say that from the spinal medulla is how we work, how we command the body in different levels to the three nervous systems, which represent the three primary forces. So when we fecundate the spinal medulla to the three nervous system, which are the three primary forces that create, this is how we create the different elements or develop the archetypes that are placed already in the physical body. But this Abraham, this Ruach Elohim, this Hesed, that has all the archetypes because descended through Bina into that, has to descend into Egypt. And that's why it is written that Abraham left the city of Or and went down into Egypt, which is the physical body. And this is how that spiritual force descends and creates, for the first time, Ishmael, Ishmael, which is, of course, those elements or those uh, people that exist in this physical world. Ishmael is a son of a slave, of Mizrahim. Slave of Egypt, Agar, means that the spiritual force in the beginning creates in the womb of a, of a, of a female, the uterus. From that uterus, all of us come out. So we are the symbol of Ishmael. But this Ishmael also represents people like us that lack the knowledge, that gather, like we are gathering now that gather not only in, in the Gnostic schools, but gather in other religions, that they search for the truth <coughs> that they carry within. They want for the clues, the codes that will allow them to develop their inner archetypes. That is Ishmael in Egypt. So that's the first covenant. You see, as you right now, for instance, you are studying the Kabbalah, you are studying Gnosis, you represent Ishmael, knowing this. But inside of you is your will. Of you depend to develop this. If you want really to belong to the promise given unto Abraham, and then you have to develop inside your spinal column Isaac. If you don't develop Isaac, if you don't awake the Kundalini, then you are not a son of the promise. You just are Ishmael, in exile. 
Remember that Ishmael was sent to exile into Egypt, into Mizraim, into the physical world, in other words. By, by studying this, by learning this, is how we enter into <coughs> initiation. And we explained that this is, uh, Isaac, or the first fire that ascends in the spinal column, is uh, born by the sexual transmutation of the forces of Adam and Eve, lunar and solar forces, Ida, Pingala, Ob and Ob. So that division appears in the physical world. <coughs> Thus, that only a study Kabbalah, that only a study religion, belongs to the first uh, uh, pact, which is those that study the knowledge, that exists everywhere. But the ones that belong to the pact of God with Abraham are those that awake the Kundalini that uh, develop Isaac within themselves. This Isaac is related with the Sephira Gebura. Because Hesed belongs to Abraham. So Gebura and Hesed are united when Abraham, through the alchemical work, acquires 100 years old of age. 100 years of age. This is symbolic. When you rise all the energy of your sexual force to the pineal gland, the 33 vertebrae of your spinal column in the physical body, then you extract all those elements related with the inferior kingdoms. All that is good related with the soul. And that soul unites with Isaac and gives mastery to your particular individual spirit or monad. That's why it is written that the monad is made by two. Adman Budi. We will say that Hesed is Mahatma, the great soul inside of us, of the spirit. Our own particular Abraham is Mahatma. Like Gebura is Budi, which means wisdom in Sanskrit. Both united make the monad. But there is another part of the monad that can fall into sin. And it's Tifereth. But we explain that Isaac, when you develop that Isaac, and then you, re the, you receive the first initiation of Mayor Mysteries, and then you start developing the second serpent related to the vital body, to the world of Yesod. Isaac does it. And when Isaac does it, with his particular individual, Nubva, Rebecca, and then he begets two children in Yesod, which is related with this area of the sexual force. The first is Esau, and the second is Jacob. So this Esau refers to the animal force, sexual force, that we developed physically by, in the vital body too. Everybody has that. But this Esau, as we explained in previous lectures, is poison. Has the inheritance, the animal inheritance from the past. When we were animal, irrational animals. So that poison blood comes from Esau. But we need it. Because remember that we explained that Jacob was holding the heel of Esau when he was coming out of the womb of his mother. Mean that from the sexual strength of Esau, which is the animal strength, <coughs> comes Jacob. So we need to transmute the sexual energy more in order to Jacob 
a raise in the spinal column of our vital body. That's why Jacob, in the Bible, relates to the world of Yesod and to the world of Tifereth. Because Tifereth is the third aspect of the monad. <coughs> it's with power that descends in order to develop in the vital body that superior aspect that we call the bodhicitta, the man, the consciousness that awakes with the 12 attributes. So as you see, Jacob steals the first uh, right from Esau. Because the first right, or the force that we have in the physical body, is a sexual force, which belongs to Esau, the animal in us. And that's why it's written that Jacob fought with Samael. Because Samael is a sexual strength in a Scorpio. Is the archangel that gives the strength not only to the human being, but also to the animals in the animal kingdom. And the animals utilize that strength of Esau to fornicate. But Jacob fights against Esau. And by fighting against Esau, is fighting against Samael, meaning trying to control that sexual strength, which is called On in Hebrew. And only to make of that on light on the ore. <coughs> so when that rises there, then Jacob is triumphant. And this is symbolized in the Bible when Jacob is fighting against an angel. And of course that angel is Samael, is a sexual strength. By fighting and defeating Samael, he defeats Esau as well. Because Esau, the animal force of the body, is an outcome of Samael, the sexual force, and Scorpio, symbol of a, symbolized by a Scorpio, Mars. So you, you see here the development of those archetypes according to the initiation. And then this Jacob, triumphant, develops the 12 tribes because he is situated exactly in Yasod and united with Tiferet. <coughs> That's why if we want to represent Jacob, we represent it with the letter Vav, because he is a Serampin inside of us. <coughs> this letter Vav, when you write the letter Vav, you write it with two Vavs. Vav! Uh, and that Vav, the first Vav is Tiferet, and the second Vav is Yasod. Unite in both, then we enter into the world of Eden. Because Jacob is the one, the first one, that enters into Eden. We were expelled from Eden, but through Jacob we enter into it and we develop the 12 archetypes, attributes. Which you know are the 12 tribes of Israel. But the 12 tribes of Israel <coughs> had to develop. In the world of Hod, which is the second Sephira, which relates to the astral body. All these attributes are placed in Hod, in the third initiation of Mayor Mysteries, where all the 12 forces, which in this case are 11. Because still Benjamin is not uh, being born. This, uh, you know, the ten patriarchs of those forces of Hod sell Joseph to Mithraim. In other words, through Joseph, the forces descend into Egypt again, into our physical body. That's called the exile. But the first one that enters is Joseph. And that's why, Kabbalistically, Joseph represents also Yesod. But the covenant, those that know 
the mystery of sexual transmutation. That is Iosephas, as many times we explain in different lectures. Iosephas. Is Cephas means stone, the stone of Yesod, and the duality of Eo. So this Joseph is that. That's why it's sold to Egypt. Because every initiation that we start in order to climb the tree of life, we started from the very bottom, from Malkut. Because in Malkut is where we have the duality. Adam and Eve. Adam the man, Eve the woman. The priest and the priestess. The mystery of Sabbat or Shabbat, the sexual act. Not like animals, but like human beings with transmutation. And this is how we find that uh, Joseph represents Yosephus, the son of Yesod, in Jacob represents Tifereth, the human soul. In other words, Jacob needs Joseph. That's why Joseph was the favorite of Jacob. Because through his uh, vesture of many colors, which represents the astral light, all the archetypes descend into the physical body. Thanks to Joseph, we receive all the force in the physical body. And then we enter into the initiation, which we explain is related <coughs> with the book, The Seven Words, written by the master Samael on Beor. He explains with luxury there. During the time when Joseph is in exile in Egypt as a slave, you know, he becomes uh, a king, or better said, uh, second after the Pharaoh or the king of Egypt. And uh, <coughs> Benjamin, another son, is being born. <coughs> Through the transmutation of the sexual forces in the physical body of those archetypes. And then we enter into the world of Hod by creating or developing another archetype which is called Benjamin which represents the forces from above from the world after that, the world of Atsilus and that's why the astral solar body which is Benjamin is that vehicle that unites our Joseph, our physical personality with the supreme immanence of the solar father, Ra. The astral body is the first vehicle that is uh, created in the spinal medulla with the third fire that ascends. That is in synthesis where we uh, explain in a previous lecture how those forces enter. But then you know the story that uh, there was a famine in Egypt and uh, the archetypes, the tribes of Israel, descend into Mizraim in order to look for food. Of course, that dissension is uh, due uh, to, the, to the initiation. <coughs> but now, as you know, after the third initiation is developed, then it is written in the book of Exodus. Uh, the first chapter it says now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt Mizraim every man and his household came with Jacob 
I mean, this Jacob, of course, you know, is a sexual force that comes down into the physical body. Ruben, Simon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Sabulon, Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Those are the 12 names. 12 names of the uh, tribes of Israel. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob. The loins, the sexual force of Jacob. Were 70 souls. For Joseph was in Egypt already. I mean, Joseph was already in Egypt. That's why they descend. Because if Joseph wouldn't, wouldn't be in Egypt, they could not descend. Joseph is that force in the physical body that knows the covenant. And through that initiation is how they descend. This is how you understand it. Now, 70 souls. You remember the archetypes of the world of Asiluth are 10. Plus the Serampin, which is formed by the seven lower Sephiroth. Below that, multiply those 10. For 7, <coughs> you have 70. The synthesis. 70 souls means 7 archetypes, right? Through the lower Sephiroth. That uh, we explain descend through Jacob. Jacob is Tifereth, the human soul. In other words, through the human soul is how these archetypes enter into Egypt, into the physical body, and developed. It's the human soul, the one that works under the guidance, of course, of the Spirit of God, the Ruach Elohim. So, this is how you understand how in the Bible is written that 70 souls descend with the 12 tribes. Because the 12 tribes, of course, symbolizes the 12 archetypes of the 12 zodiacal signs, which are symbolized or synthesized in Chokmah, the second Sephira. But then the... Uh, I wrote here uh, one uh, uh, verse from the Gospel of Matthew in order for you to understand about these archetypes. Peter asked Jesus the following. <coughs> then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft Shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? You see? That's a Kabbalistic question. Why seven times? Because the real man has seven bodies. The spirit, the divine soul, the human soul, the mind, the emotional body, the vital body, and the physical body. So those are the seven bodies of the true human being. So when you commit a, a, a mistake, the whole man is the one that is doing it. You see? That's why that, which symbolizes the upper Eden, this is where the man fell, you see, into sin. Because that man represents the lower seven Sephiroth. We explain already how the man sins or falls. So, so we have to forgive somebody that sinned against us seven times? Jesus said unto him, I said unto thee, until seven times, but until seven times seven. Until seventy times seven. If you ask, see, why is Jesus says that you have to forgive seventy times seven? If you don't know Kabbalah, if you, you make the addition, it says, how is this that I had to, maybe just a number that Jesus occurred? He might have said 87 times, right? But it's 70 times 7. Because he, he was a rabbi. He was the, the divine rabbi of Galilee. And he knew what he was talking about. In other words, 
for you to annihilate resentment and all those defects related with your ego, you have to work in your seven bodies. And in each body, you have seven churches. With the book of Revelation talks about the seven churches of Asia are the spinal column, or seven chakras, as they said in, in, in Hinduism. The seven churches had to be purified but it, because the soul dwells in each of them. So when you rise those seven, these are the seven times in the seven bodies, which relate to the world of Asilud, the ten archetypes in synthesis. In other words, in other words Jesus is saying, you have to go inside your psyche, you see, ten sephiroth, the true man, which is seven, and the seven parts of the medulla, which are the seven churches, or seven chakras. Seventy times seven. This is how you have to work. That's why we wonder when somebody says, oh, you can annihilate your ego just in this physical world. I mean, Malkut. How are you going to annihilate only in Malkut? When there are 70 times 70. If you say 70 times, you say 7 by 7, 49 levels. We call it the, seven, the 49 levels of the mind. And then, in other words, intellectually here, we know about these levels. But you had to develop that inside. You, as you know your physical body now, you have to know the vital body, the astral body, the mental body, the causal body, and all that. It implies meditation and awakening. This is how uh, you comprehend what is written uh, in the Bible. Seventy times seven, says the Master Jesus. And uh, Joseph died, and his brethren, and all that generation, and the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. The land is a physical body. With that development in you, when you are working in that initiation, you see how all of those senses developed, and all of those attributes of Israel within you. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. That is the next step. When you study the human body you understand that we have three nervous systems or three brains as we said. The central nervous system, which is the brain and the medulla, and the grand sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The cerebrum, or the brain and the spinal medulla, <coughs> is the throne of the spirit. Hesed should work there and control Egypt. But since we are in the regeneration, Still, the spirit doesn't control the brain, as you know, because the brain is a vehicle of the mind. The mind is sinful, represented here by the Pharaoh. In, in other words, this mind, this Pharaoh in each one of us, control the physical body, Mizrahim, Egypt. In each one of us. The mind think that he is the king of everything. And this is a, our problem, our intellect. We should realize that the intellect is only a vehicle for the spirit. But when we don't realize that the intellect, the mind, is only a vehicle for the spirit, and then we push away the spirit, which should sit, sit on his throne, which is the brain and the spinal medulla of our physical body, which is Egypt. 
But then another king, Ross, is written in the book of Genesis. That implies the fourth initiation of major mysteries. In other words, the entrance into the world of Netzah. You see? And many times we told you that Netzah is the mind. The mind that we had to develop that should work under the service of the spirit. But even when we develop the solar mind, the mind is always stubborn. We have an animal mind. But even if we have a solar mind, we have to control that mind. Don't think that because you create a solar mind, of course, the solar mind is that element that Paul of Tarsus state. We have the mind of the Lord. I mean, we have to create that mind. That mind is developed in the spinal medulla as well. That second womb. After we create the astral body, we create that mind, which is solar. And that mind gives us comprehension of the mysteries of the Bible, of the mysteries of any book, sacred book, of all the sacred religions. Understanding because that mind understands the wisdom. <coughs> That's why it's written that another king rose in Egypt that didn't know anything about the development of Joseph or the desire, desiring forces or the forces of desire or the astral plane. Because Joseph, etc., is related with the astral plane. The, with the astral plane is related with, with the world of dreams. Remember that it's written that Joseph was skillful in interpreting dreams. Because that is in relation with the emotional. And we go outside the language of dreams, or the language of the Bible, is there in the world of dreams. The astral world. But when we enter into initiation, we develop our own particular individual Joseph that understands that language. But when we enter into the fourth initiation, the creation of the mental body, another king, another pharaoh, takes control of, 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 the, of the brain, of the central nervous system. And of course, put aside the emotional forces or control the emotional forces and those forces which are the 12 tribes or 12 attributes or 12 archetypes and all those elements that came down from it helped to develop the pyramid of thought the pyramid any pyramid symbolizes thought the mind the mental body. Egypt ruled at that time when Moses wrote those books that world. Hmm. So in other words the brain the ve physical vehicle of the mind is the one that rules and in this day and age you know the intellect the intellectuals rule this world and they're making a mess of the economy between parentheses. But anyhow, the same was happening in the time of Moses, right? When that emperor forgot that thanks to the forces or the archetypes that Joseph brought wealth to Egypt, he uh, ignored about that. He ignored about the archetypes. And that's precisely what we always do. And it's because the mind, the brain, is related with the senses. And we, we identify with the external world. That's the mind. That's the Pharaoh. While Joseph relates only to the internal world. And that's why it says that ignore about Joseph. He didn't know anything about Joseph. Because he was identified with the physical world. So we had to educate. Whether we have lunar or solar mind, we had to educate the mind. Because that's the problem. Always. And that's why... Even though <coughs> that pharaoh or that solar body was 
elaborated or created thanks to the tribes of Israel because they were, of course, making the bricks, making the mortar, making everything. Yeah, because all those are the archetypes that we need in order to build our own particular pyramid. You see the symbol here? Because everything that exists in the exterior world is a symbol. So the pyramid is a symbol of thought. That's why we said the pyramid of thought. So the, those archetypes were, in other words, like slaves. Or act like slaves within us, controlling by the mind. Then we need a liberator. Because the failure of the mind is a problem. And then it's written that the body of willpower has to be born inside of us. Which is the next body. Which is Tifereth, the causal body. See, the union has to go there. That's why when we talk about Moses, we talk about Tifereth. But Jacob reached only that level of Tifereth. Moses, willpower, goes beyond, goes to that. That's the difference between Moses and Jacob. Moses goes up to that and see God face to face. That's the causal body. That's why it is written in the book of Genesis. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. You see the tower of Levi, or, I mean the tribe of Levi. Comes to my mind the, the book of Leviticus, which is a book related with the priests. The rules that you have to follow when you enter into this path. You have to know Kabbalah in order to understand that. Levi is related with priesthood. So when you read, you read for instance, that a man of the tribe of Levi, we were said, well, this man is the one that, that knew how to control the sexual potency, transmute the sexual force. The Levi Atan. That's the force of the priest. When a priest is officiating, he's utilizing that force of the Levi Atan, which is a sexual potency. The Leviathan is uh, also the, that force that swallowed Jonah, which means dove in Hebrew, the dove of the Holy Spirit. It's a swallow there in the sexual force. So this man of Levi, the Leviathan, took a priestess from the tribe of Levi as well. So they were both of the tribe of Levi, means they were initiates, they were priests and priestess. In order to fecundate, in order to create within them, Moses. <coughs> and you know the story about Exodus. That the Pharaoh knows very well that the body of will, do the will of God, Moses. So he wants to destroy anyone that comes after him. You know that story, which is also repeated in the story of Jesus. Because Jesus also represents that force, but beyond Moses. Because Jesus is another archetype that goes beyond that. He goes into Chokhmah and even into the Absolute. But here we are talking only about Mo, our own particular individual, Moshe. Remember that Moses is born and is hidden in the river, Nile. The sexual potency, of course, because any river is a symbol of the sexual force. His sister is watching him from afar. That sister is a Shekinah. The glory of God that is with him from that body. Moses existed, of course, physically. But he came to represent that particular individual Moshe or Moses that we have to develop 
after the creation of the solar mind. That is the body of willpower. And that's why Moses is the one that really controls the Pharaoh. In other words, telema, willpower, is that element that controls the mind. Our mind is a donkey. It's a mule. It's a stubborn, even if it is solar. To control the mind is only possible with willpower, which is symbolized on Moses. That's why Moses is being born in Yesod. And that's why Moses represents the man into the image of God that performs all those miracles and those wonders inside of us. How many commandments Moses brought to the world? Ten, the ten Sephiroth. How many wonders he performs in front of the mind, the Pharaoh? Ten. Ten plagues. Because each plague is related, of course, with the tree of life, the ten Sephiroth. And the killing of the firstborn. Well, which is the firstborn? The firstborn is Keter. That's the first emanation of the tree of life, Keter. The firstborn, of course, in the world of Klippoth, which is altered. In other words, Keter should rule here, in our brain. But instead, we have, of course, the ego, the intellect. So when we study the tree of life, the ten Sephiroth, and the ten plagues that Moses leash, uh, unleashed in Egypt, it's related with our physical body. Because here in Egypt, Mizrahim, the physical body, is where the Pharaoh controls our own particular individual Pharaoh. So Moses began and transformed the serpent into a staff, and the staff into a serpent. And then his brother, Aaron, Aaron, which represents Chesed in that line, is the one that, together with him, uh, performed those wonders. And of course, <coughs> Moses is a shepherd, as Jacob was a shepherd, because he's Tifereth. Tifereth, the human soul, is willpower. But the only one that can go to the mountain and see God in the flame of fire, in the burning bush, is Moses. So there you have the letter Shin, which is in the heart, represents these three Sephiroths. Chesed, Geburah, Tifereth. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And those Shin descend into the war of Malkut. I mean, uh, into Yesod, which is represented by the letter Mem. We remember that we said that letter Mem is water. And this is the first letter in the word Moses, Moshe. Right? So this Mem contains the, le the letter Shin, which are the three patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Within Mem, means Moshe. The last letter, which is the letter G, is the symbol of the physical body. In other words, that Moshe, Mem, Shin, He, is this willpower that acts with the physical body in order to make the wonders, ten wonders of Egypt. And the last one is the killing of the firstborn, but this is in the mind. In order to take Israel, all those archetypes, out from slavery. Because right now, all those archetypes that we have are bottled up within lust, within anger, within pride, greed, gluttony, laziness. Many defects. We have to liberate those. And that's the exodus. Now, when we talk about age, the first initiation is 100 years. The second initiation is 200 years. The third initiation is 
300 years. The fourth initiation is 400 years. But when we enter into the world of the willpower, which is Moshe, and then we come down into Egypt and start working and delivering all Israel out of Egypt, out of the control of the mind of the Pharaoh. That's the Exodus. That's why let me read for you. Now, says the book of uh, Exodus, the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. When you talk in symbology, in Kabbalistic terms, 400, that means the mental body. 30, that means the fire of the next body, which is the causal or body of willpower, is in the 30th vertebra. Ready to enter into the 31st, which is related with the Exodus. <coughs> and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the self same day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out of the land of Egypt. <coughs> The Lord, you know, means Adonai, will be the, the, the Lord of Malkut, came out of Egypt from Israel, from the physical body, out, in order to create a body of willpower and to go into the Exodus. In other words, the so called Exodus is symbolic. People that read literally the Bible, they think that really the physical Israelites were passing the Red Sea. And doing all of that physically, there was not such physical exodus as is explained in the book of Exodus. It is something initiatic. The Red Sea represents the passional forces of the physical body. To divide the Red Sea is the same as what God did in Genesis. To divide the waters from the waters in order to pass through beyond good and evil. Because there are a lot of people in this day and age that are trying to explain how the Israelites came from Egypt, literally from in the Middle East of Africa, past the Red Sea into the Promised Land, which is Israel, there now in the Middle East. Of course, it was written in that way, but those wonders that Moses performed, which is willpower, is related with an initiation, related with a sixth dimension. With Tifereth. Because it's written very clearly, Kabbalistically, that Israel left Egypt at 430 years. That's precisely the moment in which the initiate, when he's entering Nirvana, a guardian of Nirvana appears and says, in the vertebra 31st, after the vertebra 30. Which path are you going to follow now? The direct path or the spiral path? Of course, <coughs> if the ancient says, I take the spiral path, he doesn't go into the Exodus. Because the Exodus is related with the direct path. It's written Kabbalistically and it's showing that in the book of Exodus. So that's why. Moses was a revolutionary initiate. Of course, we don't deny that at that time there were not only Moses, but many other masters in Atlantis that were pulling people out of Atlantis in order to originate this uh, Aryan race. But those uh, uh, symbols of the Exodus to the Red Sea symbolize the sinking of Atlantis. But Kabbalistically, symbolically, in order to show the people how to go out of this slavery in which we are, physically, psychologically, spiritually speaking, the book of Exodus was written. And every single 
archetype or name in Exodus is a symbol that we have to comprehend, that we have to understand. And that's why after the Exodus, after the 430 years, when Moses, of course, took the direct path, that's why they went into the wilderness. Because the direct path is the path of the wilderness. It's the path in which you have to suffer your karma. Forty years. Symbolically, of course, the letter Mem is 40. It means that you have to enter into the path and patiently and with patience, you possess your souls. What souls? All the elements that are bottled up into the ego, which are the children of Israel, of course. Little by little, you go into the direct path. Symbolically, I said, it's 40 years. In order to return into the promised land. So this promised land is really the higher Sephiroth. The promised land is not that the people think in Israel, in the Middle East, that all those that believe in Judaism will reunite. That's to interpret things literally. The real promised land is within, in different levels. When you reach really the promised land, you resurrect. Jesus entered into the promised land after performing all of that sacrifice that he did in himself and teaching that with his physical life. But if you want to enter into the Exodus, <coughs> you need the age of 430 years. Hmm? You didn't go, uh, whatever you, is your age is, maybe you are 26 or 30 or 50. No, you cannot go into the Exodus with that age, physical age. What you need is esoteric, initiatic age, 430 and then you decide. But let me tell you, there are many initiates that reach 430. And when they see the guardian in front of them, the guardian says, well, where do you go? You go into the wilderness, into the promised land, the direct path, or you go into the spiral and to forget about humanity. And they said, oh, I go to the spiral first. I don't want to suffer. And they forget about humanity. Are very rare the ones that take the exodus, the direct path. Then they receive the initiation of Tifereth. <coughs> if you read the books of the Master Samael on the Lord, you will understand. He says, you receive the initiation of Tifereth after you take the direct path. Otherwise, you don't receive it. Because the initiation of Tifereth is a very special initiation in which Chokmah, the Christ, literally is united with Tifereth. It makes the Son of Man. The Son of Man is a dissension of Tifereth, united with Christ in the initial of the direct path. That's the coming of the, of the Son of Man. Again, the coming of the Son of Man is not like the fundamentalist think that all of a sudden will appear in, in the clouds, Jesus coming with angels and taking all of them into heaven because they believe in Jesus. No. If they reach the esoteric age of 130 first and they take the right path, then Jesus will come. Jesus means Savior. The Savior, the Christ, which is fire, Shin, will come into them and will take them out in the rapture. But that is internal, in the sixth dimension. It has nothing to do with the physical world. This is how you comprehend and you see it. That's why when you see the humanity how it is right now, there is a war because suppose that the Israelites had to go into the Middle East. There is also in Gnosticism a lot of uh, controversies because they do not understand the knowledge. They don't comprehend that uh, Israel is something psychological. The promised land is something dimensional. And then you become and uh, transform yourself into a serious practitioner. And everything is inside, not outside. Because not only the Bible is interpreted in a very literal manner, but also all the sacred books. If you go into India, you see how these Brahmans, 
believe that they are a special sect and they have the privilege because they are Brahmins, so all the people below them are inferior. That's in India. And if you study every religion, you will find that there is always a special rank in every single religion. Would they think that they are the best because they are doing this, doing that physically? But the work is internal, not external. Do you have questions? That's the dissension. Exactly. The dissension, the dissension, the 12 tribes start with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because they had to descend to the physical body with all the archetypes, attributes, in order for willpower, Moses, to take them out. And to make, because the, the making of the man into the image of God is all that process. The man into the image of God appears when we enter into the promised land after 40 years of walking in the wilderness. That's a symbol. doesn't mean that it had to be literally 40 years. It would be less or more. That depends. Exactly. It needs to go down first and then to go up. In other words, those archetypes need to develop themselves into good and evil. They descend down. That's why you see the first son of Abraham is a son of fornication. That's why it is written that in that, Adam and Eve commit fornication. They need to descend in order to know knowledge. That. After you acquire that, then you need to take all those elements and to become a man into the image of God. Which means a man that knows good and evil. Because God knows good and evil. A real human being knows the good from the evil and the evil from the good. And go beyond that. But if you are stagnant in good, no, the, the human being that the book of Genesis talks it's all that story written in Genesis to the Exodus, to the promised land. This is all the, those attributes that are psychological and spiritual. It has nothing to do with the physical. Master Jesus re represented that he died physically and then resurrected. This, but Paul of Tarsus says, this impure has to become pure. It's a transformation, alchemical transformation. <coughs> but that Ruach Elohim has to descend and to fecundate the spinal medulla in the beginning. That's Abraham within you. If you don't fecundate your spinal medulla, it doesn't matter what you believe or what group you belong to. If you don't do that, this is, this is a, a chemical, psychological work written in symbols in the book of Genesis and Exodus. Do you have another question? Yeah? Is there any uh, Kabbalistic reason why they, uh, they don't count Joseph as a tribe anymore and just change and use Ephraim and Manasseh as tribes? Is there any other reason besides why, why, why would they change it? <coughs> Who? The, is Israel, is the Bible, the Bible. Well, the thing is this. Joseph itself represents the lower righteous one, which is related with Yesod, meaning those people that know the knowledge, that comprehend the knowledge and practice it. They follow the covenant. And Benjamin represents the upper righteous one. Those are the two only sons of uh, Rachel, or Raquel, I said. 
and uh, the rest are the children of Leah and all the mates which represent the different unions and forces in the tree of life of the 12 tribes and uh, of course the tribe that uh, is related with Malkut in relation with the work that we are performing here is Judah the tribe of Judah that's why a real one that follows the direct path is called a Jew, right? And the book of Revelation says, those that said that they are Jews and are not. Because in this physical world, there are many, of course, Jews that live in different places, but a real Jew is the one that follows the path, the solar path. Judah is a lion. The lion is Leo, the solar force, Ra. Every tribe has its symbol. We explained that already in other lectures. Of course, this lecture is understood uh, by those that know uh, about the Bible. Because the stories that we are relating here or talking about, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the tribes of Israel, the Exodus, are the first books of the Bible. Books that were written in order to guide those that are on the knowledge. The Bible is written for those that want to follow the path. Is we have to is that what we have to understand. And of course, we talk about that because uh, Kabbalah gnosis is something that we have to learn in order to wisely interpret the wisdom of the Bible. That's why it is written that in the Hebrew letters are hidden, or is hidden, I mean, the mystery of uh, the mystery of God, of the word of God. By meditating, for instance, let me tell you a practice or an experience that I had. I was meditating in this lecture, trying to 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 find something in order to give you. And then I have an experience, internal, Samadhi. A master appeared. And that master uh, was a, a rabbi, of course, an illuminated rabbi, like the divine rabbi of Galilee, Jesus. And this is what the rabbi was doing, <coughs> performing something was utilizing the 22 letters in order to, to make a house, you know. And he was telling me, you see this letter? This is for the window. This is the letter, that letter. And this is another letter. So the whole house that he was building was made uh, with the 22 letters. So when he said, oh, a house made of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Of course, I understand, I said. This is the house that is built on the rock. Because all the attributes of this 22 attributes that you're talking to me are related to the world of Yesod, the rock that you build. Hmm? Because if you build in theories, I mean, if you just memorize the 22 letters and blah, blah, blah about Kabbalah and you don't do anything, you are building your house in sand, in theories, in dogmas. As Master Jesus says, you have to build on the rock. And that house, I said, yeah, it's beautiful, made of the 22 letters. That house should be my house. And that house talk, I said, says something. What is that house saying? It is talking because it's made of 22 letters. It's saying something, you're right. Is a saying house, a talking house. And what is that house saying? Through the 22 letters? He was saying, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Everything was made by the 22 letters of the word of God. Through the initiatic path, of course. And to finish with this lecture, let me tell you an experience that I had. And that's why it is necessary to meditate in order not to fall into confusion. I was at the edge of a river, seated on a rock. 
and I was pensive. Then two rabbis came from behind, and I was dressed like in the ancient times. And they told me, are you Moses? And I said, not that I know. Are you, be, uh, you belong to the tribe of what type? Um, to which tribe do you belong? Was his question. I said, well, I belong to the tribe of Judah. Because, you know, Kabbalistic answer, right? Oh, then you are Moses. And then he put me a piece, piece of cloth on my on shoulders, which is a Hebrew cloth took me, hugged me, and took me away from that river and walk. You know, that river is your sword, of course. When I had experience, I went to the master, Samael. You know, he said, Master, I had this experience. And they told me, oh, then you are Moses. Ah, he said, Master Samael, you are not Moses. Moses is a superman. He's a resurrected master. So interpret that. Don't fall into confusion. And I said, well, then who is my inner being? And then he gave me other experiences there, and I understood what my inner being was. But in the experience, if, if you don't ask and you don't meditate, then I will say, oh, I, I am Moses. You know? But each one of us has his own particular individual Moses. It was something to live with in my own path. You know, that Moses, I said, you are Moses, then you are willpower, you have to work. You are doing the work. Go ahead. Right? That's the meaning of that experience. Many other initials can have experience because each one of us has to develop Moses Sabaoth. Moses Sabaoth means all Israel out of Egypt. In order to develop your own ma mastery, your own, your own being. Because there is somebody there that says that he's the Bodhisattva of Moses. And Moses is a superman. Master Samael on the earth told me face to face. You are not Moses. Moses is a superman. It's a resurrected master. Like telling me, understand that, that and this is how you comprehend. Because in many other uh, experiences, you can experience other archetypes. Moses is an archetype. John the Baptist is an archetype. Jesus is an archetype. All the 12 apostles are archetypes. The 12 tribes are archetypes within your own psyche. If you are not aware, your own Pharaoh will, will feel that he's mighty. And the mind is not mighty. The mind is a donkey. It's a mule that we have to control. Remember, we are only serves of the Lord. No more questions? Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,